please. So thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, uh, thank you, um, Vincenzo. Thank you, Lu uh, Luca, for, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to share this time today with, with, uh, with all of you. Uh, and also thank you very much to all the participants, not only for, for its assistance, but I'm pretty sure also for its uh, future passion. And of course, my apologies for these technical problems. Um, by the way, this is the very first time that I'm speaking at uh, Torino University or at Udine University, wherever you prefer. And it's a pity that due to the current circumstances, uh, this should be, this needs to be conducted in this uh, online format. Uh, but anyway, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to to stay here today with all of you. I'm just hoping the best uh, for the next few months. Uh, hopefully, the pandemic will give us a chance to to breathe. Um, but anyway, going to the matter of of my uh, of my today's exposition, uh, what I would like to do today is to share with you uh, some of the results obtained in a, a, a joint project with Asaf Rinot and Dimas Sinapova, where we introduce or where we develop a general iteration scheme for conducting uh, forcing iterations around a singular cardinal, around singular cardinals and uh, a small successor of them. But instead of uh, digging into the uh, technicalities of this, of this framework that we can discuss it further if you like in the time for questions or uh, during the presentation, what I would like to do, or what I will try to do, is to conduct my whole exposition through, uh, uh, through the very first application of our framework, which has to do with stationary reflection. Stationary reflection is a classical and well-known notion uh, in modern set theory, and I think it's, uh, it gives us a very good chance to introduce all the material uh, that they want to talk about. Um, so the results and the material of this talk uh, are based on the following uh, two papers with, again, with uh, Rinot and Sinapova. Both of them are currently in press and are, of course, uh, already available in the internet. So please feel free to download them and send, uh, send us your feedback if you feel like it. It will be a great pleasure to know that someone else is interested in, interested in this matter. Uh, cool. So, um, as I've said before, I don't want to, in principle, I don't want to dig too much into the details of the iteration scheme, but rather I would like to conduct uh, my whole exposition uh, through this uh, a concrete application that we that we have. But uh, more precisely, there are three three main concepts that will guide my exposition. The first guiding concept. Uh, would be the notion of stationary reflection. And in particular, I will be interested in the notion of stationary reflection at the level of uh, successors of a singular cardinals, typically the first successor of a singular cardinal. This is a well known property uh, for many set theorists, uh, which have found applications in other areas of mathematics, actually. Uh, but it's, um, as we will see in a minute, it is actually a particular instance of a more general phenomenon, uh, not only in the theory, but actually in mathematics, uh, which is known as, uh, at I known as uh, compactness. Stationary reflection is a particular instance of uh, compactness phenomenon. The second guiding concept of my talk would be the failure of the singular cardinal hypothesis. I'm pretty sure that many of you will be familiar with this with this uh, combinatorial principle, but for those of you who, who are not, this is essentially the uh, parallel to the realm of singular cardinals of the well-known well uh, generalized continuum hypothesis. And contrarily, or unlike stationary reflection, this is a particular instance of the opposite to reflection, namely it's a prototypical example of failure of compactness of or of incompactness if you prefer. And finally, the third and last guiding concept of my exposition would be the so-called family of Riquetai force. And in particular, I will be interested in uh, the iterations of how 
uh, how do we iterate this this uh, type of forcings? Uh, generally speaking, I mean, the, 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 the situ I mean the, the the thing is a bit more 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 elaborated. I mean, I'm gonna give you a very succinct uh, uh, definition or very succinct uh, description, but generally speaking, pre forcings are the are the uh, forcing notions uh, which are generally devised to to change cofinalities and to deal with a singular with the structure of singular cards, right? We will see in a minute that there are more, I mean, there are more things around, but essentially this is the, uh, the idea. And the general idea of my talk will be to show you or to argue with you or to, you know, try to convince you uh, that the later, the later class, namely the class of pre forcings can be used to resolve the, intri the intrinsic tension existing between both stationary reflection and the failure of the singular carbon of hypothesis. And that actually this extends to uh, the project, I mean, this, this extends to the aim of trying to combine uh, instances of uh, general instances of compactness and incompactness. This would be generally uh, uh, my aim in this chart, try to convince you that, that this uh, class of forcings uh, give us a chance to uh, to resolve this uh, intrinsic tension between compactness and incompactness at the level of singular cardinals. But to be practical, what I will try to do, what, what I will actually try to do is to give you some ideas, some intuitions of the proof of the following result, which is actually the very first application of our method. Uh, and as I've said before, it's a theorem about stationary reflection at the level of uh, a, a singular card. So, um, so we will begin with an uh, increasing sequence of uh, super compact cardinals, omega uh, sequence of super compact cardinals, which is, by the way, a very typical uh, assumption in this area of singular cardinal combinatorics. And what we, uh, what we say is that uh, modulo these assumptions uh, one can produce a generic extension of the universe where kappa, the limit of these cardinals, is a strong limit, a singular cardinal, where the singular cardinal hypothesis fails, and moreover, where one can uh, get a finite simultaneous reflection of the stationary subsets at the level of kappa plus, meaning that every finite uh, collection of stationary subsets of kappa plus reflect at that common point. Namely, there exists some ordinal alpha below kappa plus with uncountable cofinality, such that all of these uh, stationaries that we fix uh, um, intersected with alpha are still stationary. So this is the, the theorem. Um, by the way, it's worth to be say that on one hand, the result uh, is optimal because for instance, or in the sense that if uh, one aims to get infinite simultaneous reflection uh, of the stationaries of kappa plus, namely, if instead of starting with a finite sequence of stationary, you start with a countable sequence of stationaries, uh, this outright implies that GCH holds at kappa. So in this sense, the, the result is sharp. And the second thing that is worth commenting is that similar results have been obtained independently and around the same time by other authors. Uh, such as Veneria, Hajut, and Unger on one hand, and shortly after by Didi. But, they, but the, ideas is, are, the ideas are completely different. We used, we exploit this uh, uh, general iteration scheme uh, for conducting these uh, forcing iterations uh, along uh, uh, singular cardinals, and their approach is it's different. Does not use this kind of thing, uses kind of argument using iterated ultra powers. Uh, can, can I ask a question? Well, sure, go so ahead. does this compare with with um, Asaf, uh, Sharon, and Gitik work of? Uh, okay, uh, uh, you mean the failure of uh, square? Yes. Well, they have this this simultaneous reflection, and uh, but they didn't get the failure of SCH. Uh, they just get. Uh, they have simultaneous reflection of stationaries. I mean, of finite what... many say, don't. don't wasn't there a result a few years ago, like when I was getting my PhD, more or less, by Sharon and Gitik, 
where they the, prove the um, that this type of reflection that you get uh, can can occur at a singular limit. As far as I can tell, that there are two things. There are these, these work by Chagon and Gittig, yes. uh, showing that a failure of the CH is consistent with failure of a uh, weak square. This is joint work between Sharon and Gittig. And this result, in concrete, this result about reflection of stationaries was announced by the by Sharon in his PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. Actually, we will use some ideas of him. But uh, I need to say that I mean we, we were working a lot with his proof uh, when we were trying to uh, when we were trying to develop this abstract uh, iteration scheme. But uh, we found some some problems in his, in his argument. There, there okay. were problems with the verification, both of the uh, of the uh, that you keep the the right chain condition along the way to produce this generic extension, and also uh, that you preserve you actually preserve the uh, pretty property. So okay. so this is the thing. Okay, thank you. Um, so all my talk will be uh, guided by by giving you some uh, intuitions about uh, the proof of this uh, theory. Uh, so to begin with the material of my talk, let me begin with this first thematic block uh, devoted to stationary reflection. Stationary reflection is, as I said, is a well-known notion in classical set theory. It will be pretty much known by many of you, but let me just uh, introduce the material from the very beginning, not assuming prior knowledge over it, in case someone is not familiar with it. Uh, but uh, before that, let me uh, let me discuss the more general uh, phenomenon known as compactness principle, to which in which stationary reflection is just a particular instance. So a compactness principle for a given mathematical phi uh, property phi is a statement that can be framed into the following slogan. If given on a structure, if we are given on a structure and a property phi, a property, a mathematical property phi, then compactness principle for phi says that provided every small substructure has property phi, then necessarily the whole structure has property phi as well. Right? So we have a structure. This structure has a property that evolves up is, and the compactness principle tell us that this needs, I mean, th this necessarily implies that the whole structure has property phi as well. The dual of these principles are the so-called reflection principles. In this case, the reflection principle for a given mathematical property phi says that provided a given structure, a given mathematical structure has property phi, has a desired property phi, then necessarily there is a small subpiece of it, there is a small substructure of it having property phi as well. There are two remarks which are in order about this principle. The first one is that, uh, actually three, sorry. The first one is that it is equivalent to speak about compactness or reflection, because actually compactness for a given mathematical property phi is equivalent to reflection for the negation of phi. So, in practice, when we talk about reflection or compactness, we are talking about the very same phenomenon. The choice in the in the way we formulate a given statement following the compactness style or the reflection style just depend on which of them provides a more clear formulation. But in practice, they are the same. The second remark is that when I talk about uh, structures and substructures and the like. I'm considering a very liberal uh, uh, definition of what a structure is. I'm not referring necessarily to uh, formal model theoretic structures. For me, a structure here is a set of sentences, it's a stationary set, can be a tree, can be many things, any meaningful mathematical object that you can think of. Right? And the third remark is that typically, or at least in pra many, many practical cases, the, the term is small. Uh, being modulated is modulated by by uh, by by having cardinality less than uh, a relevant cardinal kappa. So, for instance, uh, a small might mean having cardinality less than Alex zero, namely being finite, or might mean 
having cardinality less than LF1, namely being uh, uh, countable, and the like. Right? So this is general, the template of compactness uh, principles. And to motivate why uh, do I think that these uh, principles are not only shouldn't be uh, interested, interesting not only for, for set theorists or logicians, but for other uh, mathematicians, let me give you uh, some examples motivating this, this, uh, this notion. And of course, uh, we are in the logic seminar, so let me uh, uh, do this uh, completely BI's choice and start with the uh, with an example arising from logic. This is an example. This is a well, very uh, well known example, which has to do with the notion of kappa satisfiability. We said that a set of sentences gamma in a given language is kappa satisfiable. Kappa is an infinite cardinal. If every a collection uh, of size less than kappa t uh, is satisfiable, namely it has more. So we have a structure gamma, and we are assuming that every small substructure of it, uh, where small here means having cardinality less than kappa, has a property uh, which is having a model, right? And on this respect, there is a, a fundamental and different result in uh, first of the logic saying that if you pick any uh, set of sentences in first order logic, which has the property that any finite uh, subset of sentences of it as a model, then the theorem says that uh, necessarily the whole set of sentences have, uh, has a model as well, right? So we have a structure. Again, this is a set of sentences, and we are assuming that every every finite subpiece of it has a, has a model. And what the theorem says is that well, this implies, this outright implies that the set of sentences we started with has a model, right? And at the light of this result, it is natural to ask what happens for the natural extension of first order logic to uh, more expressible logics, such as the logics L kappa kappa or the logics uh, L kappa kappa, where you also allow uh, second order quantifiers and the like. By the way, for those of you who are not familiar with these uh, logics, this is, these are essentially um, the logics where you uh, have the natural uh, generalization of first order logic, where you allow uh, existential quantifiers and uh, conjunctions of length uh, less than kappa, right? So the question here is, what happens uh, in the context of these logics? Namely, are these logics kappa compact? Are does the do these logics uh, satisfy the higher analogous of the compactness theorem of first order logic? And here comes a wonderful connection uh, uh, between model theoretic uh, concepts and uh, concepts ar ar arising from the uh, theory of large cardinals, which was first uh, uh, pointed out by Tarski. And the result of uh, of Tarski showed that. This uh, higher order logic, high, um, more expressive uh, logics have this nice feature provided and just provided you believe in large cardinals. For instance, Tarski showed that L kappa kappa is kappa compact if and only if the cardinal uh, kappa, the relevant cardinal kappa is strongly compact. Strongly compact is just a large cardinal notion that uh, says that if if you have a filter, a kappa, a kappa complete filter over any set, then you can uh, extend it to a kappa complete uh, ultra filter. This is essentially the idea. And this is a nice model theoretic characterization of a, a, a large cardinal motion. And moreover, if you, if you want to push it harder and look for the more expressive logic where you allow, you also allow second order variables. Uh, later, Maggie will show that uh, there is a chance to 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 uh, there is a chance for this logic to be to be compact, and uh, this happens just in case the relevant cardinal kappa is extendable, which is a much stronger notion, much stronger large cardinal notion than strong compactness, uh, super compactness, and the like. And actually, the 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 the, the nice thing here is that you can push forward all these results and look. I mean, try to analyze when uh, any such a model theoretic logic has a compactness number, 
and this is essentially this essentially follows from Bopenka's principle, which is another uh, stronger uh, large cardinal uh, concept. Wonderful. Uh, the second example is one of uh, my favorite ones, and this time it comes from algebra, and in particular from abelian group theory, and it's related with this notion of kappa freeness. So, for an infinite cardinal kappa. One says that an abelian group is, is, is kappa free if all of its subgroups of size less than kappa are free. So, again, we have a, our structure, in this case, it's an abelian group. Um, and this abelian group has the property that every small um, subgroup is free, right? And we ask ourselves whether, uh, of course, we are studying compactness, so we ask uh, ourselves whether this implies that the whole group is uh, free, whether kappa freeness implies freeness, right? Or more precisely, we are asking ourselves for which cardinals kappa, kappa freeness entails freeness. And in this respect, there is a wonderful result due to Shela's, Shela, which is actually much more general than what I stated here, much more general. Uh, the result says that for singular cardinals, we have this behavior is actually available. This is a wonderful result due to him. Uh, and there is something that I would like to mention. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, one of the many examples existing showing that certain families of singular cardinals uh, outright. Uh, shows or outright uh, manifest certain forms of compactness. We will see in a minute another example of such a kind of compactness result at the level of singular cardinals. But this is the very first one. And finally, the third and last example that I would like to discuss with you uh, arises from the theory, and it's the one that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk is the the one known as stationary reflection. So again, I will be a bit pedantic and I will begin from the very beginning, from the very basics. Uh, so uh, we have two notions here. We have the notion of clap. A clap is simply a close unbounded set. We are always assuming that cap is a regular and countable cardinal. And we say that the stationary set is a subset of kappa uh, uh, meeting every uh, clap set. Um, there is a, a standard, actually, can be easily shown, uh, fact about uh, uh, clap sets, uh, which says that every clap, for every clap C, there is another subclap, namely a big set, big subset of kappa. There is a big subset of, of kappa such that all of its points have the property that C intersected with alpha is a clap. Right? So, what this is telling us morally is that clap sets reflect and actually clap sets reflect at clap many points right so since clap sets are also stationary it is natural to ask what happens with the stationaries namely do a stationary sets reflect let's see so to uh, handle this uh, to deal with this question, I need to be more precise. And first of all, I need to define what uh, does it mean? What does it mean uh, for a stationary set to reflect? A stationary set S reflects if there is um, an ordinal below kappa with uncountable cofinality such that S intersected with alpha is stationary, is again stationary. And with this notion in mind, we define the uh, principle reflection F, reflection relative to a stationary set, as the principle asserting that every stationary subset T of S reflects. And with this definition in mind, uh, we can uh, be more precise in our question and formulate it as follows. We will be interested in the in the in the question on um, on whether for for we'll be interested in the question. Um, of which cardinals kappa and which stationary subsets S of S, S of kappa, sorry, satisfies this reflection principle, namely for which stationary sets S of kappa, every stationary subset uh, T of S reflects, right? 
And to proceed with the corresponding discussion, we need, or it's convenient to separate, to separate it into three main cases, depending, of course, on the nature of kappa. The first case is when kappa is regular and linear. And here we have a very neat picture of when uh, do we have reflection of stationariness. We have a result of Tarski, I guess, or someone else from the ancient times, I don't know, uh, saying that if kappa is really compact, then every stationary subset of kappa reflects. This is an outright consequence on the fact of the fact that Reflection of stationaries is a pi one one uh, property of kappa. Wicked compact uh, wicked compact cardinals are pi one one reflected. So this is essentially the idea. But later, uh, moreover, later uh, Jensen showed that this becomes a characterization of weak compactness or a characteris of uh, characterization of which stationary sets reflect, if you like, under the assumption that. Uh, v, the universe of sets, is actually equal to the to Gödel's constructive universe. So the the upshot here of the bottom line is that, for the context of regular limit cardinals, we have a very nice picture of which special or very good knowledge of which stationary subsets of kappa reflect. The second and uh, less trivial case is when the relevant cardinal is a successor of a regular cardinal lambda. And the main difference uh, with respect to the previous case is that under these assumptions, one can never expect full reflection of stationaries. Or in other words, there is always a canonical stationary set, subset of, of kappa, uh, which never reflects. And this is the stationary subset of kappa uh, given by uh, those ordinals uh, whose cofinality is lambda. Uh, it's very easy to show that this uh, set is uh, non-reflecting. Let me show you the proof is two lines for those of you who are not familiar with it. So let an ordinal alpha less than kappa with uncountable cofinality and, and pick a clap in, in alpha, uh, just mentioning points of cofinality less than alpha. This is always possible, right? But notice now that the cofinality of alpha cannot be larger than lambda, right? Because lambda is the greatest possible cofinality up to kappa. So what we have is that this, this clap C just mentions points of cofinality less than lambda. And this implies that C uh, has an empty intersection with the set E kappa lambda. So in a nutshell, this shows that E kappa lambda uh, intersected with alpha cannot reflect. And this is true, this holds for every alpha less than kappa, so E kappa lambda can, can never reflect. So this gives, a, gives you an example of a non-reflecting stationary subset uh, at the level of a, of a successor of a ring. But still, one can hope, if, if, you, if, you, uh, if you believe in large cardinals, one can still hope uh, to obtain optimal reflection patterns. And this is what uh, Harrington Cancella did in the 80s. Uh, proving that uh, the existence of a malo cardinal is equiconsistent with a uh, reflection of stationaries uh, of kappa, uh, sorry, reflection of stationary subset of kappa sitting on non-forbidden uh, cofinalities, right? Where the forbidden cofinality is lambda, the critical cofinality is lambda. So every stationary subset of kappa that can reflect, actually reflects, can be arranged to reflect, assuming uh, suitable large cardinals in the background. And the last, and again, less trivial case is when the uh, relevant cardinal or the cardinal under consideration is a successor of a singular cardinal. And again, I, unlike the uh, previous case, here one can recover the full reflection of stationaries that one had in the context of limit uh, regular cardinals. And the first who noticed this was Magidor, one of his famous paper from the 80s. And there, Magidor showed that if you assume, again, this uh, typical uh, assumption in, in the area, if you assume omega many super compact cardinals, then you can, uh, you can uh, construct a generic extension, extension of the universe where uh, every stationary subset of Aleph omega plus one 
reflect. So again, we recover full reflection of the stationaries. But at this point of the whole story, you probably may be wondering with reason <laughs> why Magidor needed such a ridiculous amount of large cardinals, why he needed this such a strong uh, assumptions, right? Uh, even more comparing it with the with the assumptions needed by Harrington and Schiller, right? They were just using a model cardinal. Instead, here Magidor is using omega many super compact cardinals. And the answer to, to this reasonable uh, complaint is that actually these strong large cardinal assumptions do not appear by chance, but rather they are connected or they are connected with a very fundamental problem affecting the very core of set theory. But this problem is related with uh, what we know as square principles. Uh, again, this may be familiar to you, but anyway, let me give you, uh, uh, let me say some words about the square principle. So for an infinite cardinal kappa, we say that a sequence is a, a square kappa sequence. If it is a sequence indexed in kappa plus, each of the elements of the sequence C alpha are uh, clubs sitting on alpha, and the sequence is coherent in the sense that if you pick a club C alpha in the in the list and you pick some beta, which is a limit point of the club C alpha, then C alpha intersected the outcome of C alpha intersected with beta is the beta club of the sequence. So essentially. To some extent, C alpha is an n it's an n extension of C beta. This is the coherency that uh, that uh, the square principles are, are are showing are manifesting. Right. Um, of course, we say that the square kappa holds if there is such a sequence. But what is important about the or what is important for our proposals about these square uh, sequences is that they are actually what they are actually predicting is a non-compact behavior at the level of kappa plus. More precisely, what they are saying is that there is, there is no chance, there is no club C in kappa plus that can be used to continue the sequence, to continue uh, the, the square sequence. Name, um, yeah, exactly. So there is no club that can be used to put on top of the square sequence. So notice here, the the incompactness or the non-compactness pattern or the non-compactness phenomenon that the square principle is is predicting right so on one hand we have our structure right our structure is the square sequence uh, top, uh, topped with uh, with uh, some club right some club on kappa plus and we have that this structure has the feature that every small substructure every small uh, subsequence is coherent in the sense of item three. But when, when you look at the whole structure, you lose coherence, you ruin coherence. So this is essentially the, this is the essence of a square. A square is an incompactness principle. It's, it's predicting an incompactness behavior of kappa plus. The square sequence, of course, are uh, a topic by its own. I don't want to deepen into it. But uh, rather, I will just uh, I will just um, want to communicate two key ideas that will be uh, enough for my proposals. The first idea is that the square is incompatible with reflection of stationaries, and of course, this might not uh, might might seem not surprising, right? Because uh, on one half we have say we have said that. The square principles are paradigmatical instances of incompactness. And on the other hand, we have said that reflection of stationaries are prototypical examples of, of compactness. So this might not seem very surprising, but actually uh, the incompatibility is very radical in the sense that or it happens in a very dramatic way, in the sense that a square, if a square holds, then there is no chance for reflection. A square kappa implies uh, that reflection of stationaries always fails, right? This is the first idea that I want, in, uh, that I want to communicate. Square and reflections are incompatible. And the second idea is that getting rid of, getting rid of a square, avoiding a square is always hard 
and costly. Costly in terms of large cardinal assumption. But this is the idea. Avoiding a square is always hard and costly, and thus so is getting reflection of stationaries. Why is it hard? Why is it hard? Is it hard because typically a square holds in every canonical inner model of circular, right? In any reasonable L-like model, you will have always a square. But moreover, if this canonical L model of set theory, W, resembles sufficiently the universe of set, this is what we call a, a weak covering. If there is this uh, nice relationship between W and V, then a square holds outright. It holds in V, I mean, right? So this is essentially the reason why is it hard to get rid of this of this principle, because if you want to violate it, you need to violate weak covering. You need to rule out this possibility. And why is it costly? It is costly because the failure of a square typically entails the existence of inner models with large cardinals. As for instance, if you have a square at Aleph, at Aleph 1, then this implies that Aleph 2 is a malo cardinal. So if you want to violate a, a square at Aleph 1, you need to start with some form of large cardinals in the back. But actually, the situation is even, or especially, uh, especially dramatic when the uh, cardinal under consideration is singular. Because for instance, in this particular context, we have that the failure of a square, the failure of a square at a singular cardinal entails the existence of an inner model with infinitely n boolean cardinals. So if you want to violate a square at kappa, then you need to, you need to pay a, a costly price. This is essentially the idea. And the bottom line of all of this discussion is that, or what I hope I have convinced you is that arranging both, uh, sorry, arranging a reflection of stationaries at kappa plus is always hard and costly, regardless kappa is regular or singular. But the point is that the situation is, uh, more, is even more dramatic or even harder and even costly in the context of singular cardinals. This is the bottom line. Uh, up to this point. Um, nice. So let me close the first thematic block uh, uh, to discuss this uh, principle known as the singular cardinal hypothesis. As it is well known in set theory from since the advent of forcing and the results uh, by Cohen and Easton, uh, the behavior of the continuum function are restricted uh, to regular cardinals, it's almost indeterminate in the sense that there are few constraints that CFC imposes over the behavior of this, of this, of this map. Essentially, there are two, right, as shown by, by Easton. There are essentially two, two, two restrictions over the power set function of regular cardinals. The one is Kenny's theorem, and the other is a, almost a stupid uh, restriction, which is that the uh, a power set function cannot be uh, a power set function is uh, monotone non decreasing right so modulo these two uh, restrictions uh, there is plenty of freedom to manipulate the power set function at the level of regular cardinals however the situation is much more restrictive and delicate uh, when looking at uh, singular cardinals and the first one who uh, know this was silver who proved in uh, who proved in the seventies, I guess, his famous Silver's compactness theorem, which says that if you start with a singular cardinal kappa, which is of uncountable cofinality, and you assume that the GCH holds up to kappa, then what the theorem says is that necessarily it it also holds at kappa as well, right? So. Um, the moral of this is that for singular cardinals, the behavior of the uh, continuum function is sensitive to the previous behavior of the same function, right? To the previous behavior of the function at a previous cardinal, at a smaller cardinal, right? I think the next interpretation of the result uh, is uh, looking at it as a compactness theorem, right? Similar to, to Shellas compactness theorem that we mentioned uh, before, right? So, 
here we have an, an structure, a structure. This structure is kappa, our singular cardinal of uncountable cofinality. This structure has the property that every small subpiece of it, namely every piece of size less than kappa satisfies the GCH. And what the theorem says is that necessarily the whole structure needs to satisfy the GCH. Right? So it's a compactness behavior of a, a singular cardinal of uncountable cofinality. Right? There are other uh, similar results, uh, similar compactness uh, results for, for singulars of uncountable cofinality. But the upshot is this. For singular cardinals, the situation is a bit uh, more tricky. And at the light of this uh, fantastic result due to silver, it is natural to ask uh, to what extent these assumptions of uncountable cofinality is uh, actually necessary. It's actually necessary. Uh, or if you prefer, whether this assumption, uh, wh whether silver's theorem works even for uh, singular cardinals of countable cofinality. And to answer this question, one needs to consider this notion of or this principle called uh, the singular cardinal hypo hypothesis. The official, the official definition is a bit more uh, involved, not too much, but it's a bit more involved. So let me just phrase it in the context of singular strong limit cardinals, where it uh, 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 takes the form of uh, the, the ECH, right? So for singular strong limit cardinals, SCH is the same as GCH. The very first question, the very first non-trivial question that one can ask about this uh, SCH principle is whether its failure is consistent with uh, CFC. And the answer is yes. And it was provided again in the 70s uh, uh, by Silver and Pricky, uh, starting from the assumption, uh, assumptions of uh, a, a cardinal which is kappa double plus a super compact, a cardinal kappa which is kappa double plus super compact. Essentially, the, the proof idea was starting with such a large cardinal, a blow the power set of, of kappa while preserving uh, that kappa is still kappa double plus super compact or fully super compact, whatever you prefer. This is done uh, uh, violating uh, GCH at uh, every inaccessible below kappa. And uh, later, uh, forced with uh, some forcing invented by Prickly, known as, of course, Prickly forcing, that changes the cofinality of kappa to omega, uh, does not add bounded subset, um, and that's it. Since it does not add bounded subset, you still have two to the kappa large, and you get a strong limit, uh, strong limit cardinal uh, where the SCH fails. This is the very first proof. The, a consistency of the failure of the SH. And the second meaningful question about this principle is provided the failure of is consistent, which is the first witness for it, which is consistently the first witness for it. Of course, we know by virtue of Silver's theorem that it cannot be Aleph, Aleph Omega 1, right? Because it has uncountable cofinality. But maybe there is a chance uh, for Aleph for me. Uh, uh, is yes, right? Aleph Omega can be, it can be, no, it's actually the first witness for the failure of the singular cardinal hypothesis. But the answer this time was provided by Maggio who in his uh, famous paper in the Annals of Mathematics at the end of the 70s, showed that if you assume, again, a ridiculous amount of uh, large cardinals assumptions, uh, you start with enough large cardinals in the background, then you can produce a generic extension where the GCH holds up to Aleph Omega, therefore Aleph Omega is a strong limit, right? And the SCH, but the SCH fails exactly at Aleph Omega. Right? So Aleph Omega is the first, can be the first witness for, for this failure. Um, now at this point, I think it's 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 a good idea to compare it with Silver's, with the configuration predicted by Silver's theorem. This is unlike Silver's theorem, this is an incompactness result, right? It is saying that 
you have our, uh, your structure now is Aleph Omega. You have GCH up to uh, all the way up uh, Aleph Omega. But when you reach the point of Aleph Omega, you ruin the GCH. So this is an incompactness behavior of, uh, this is one of the examples of the incompactness behavior of singular cardinals of countable cofinal. Great. Um, this fantastic result was uh, later improved by Gitti and Budding, I think independently, uh, who find the uh, optimal right, uh, optimal large cardinals assumptions from which you can force this configuration. These are uh, measurable cardinals with Mitchell's order, uh, kappa double plus. Uh, but what I tried to communicate in this, uh, what I was trying to communicate in these uh, two thematic blocks is that there is tension between the failure of the singular cardinal uh, hypothesis and reflection of the specialized sets. In essence, I am trying to do some propaganda to convince you that what we have done is it's hard to to conduct to to do. But anyway, I think it's illustrative. Um, so there is tension between both principles. To I mean, there is tension to to make both principles to coexist. And I think at least some of the reasons are quite easy uh, uh, are quite easy to explain. Uh, the reason is the reason is sorry. The reason is essentially. It has to do with some technical technical aspects. So the reason is that usually uh, violating the failure of the singular uh, violating the singular cardinal hypothesis involves singularizing cardinals. So typically you start with a very large cardinal, you blow its power set while preserving its large cardinal property, and later you apply it to some kind of pre-creep type forcing machinery. A, a collapse in this cardinal, not adding, uh, and the, uh, adding bounded subsets, thus preserving cardinals, and the like, right? There are other uh, possibilities using uh, extender based uh, centered on, con on RAM model uh, singular cardinals, but uh, never mind. This is the idea getting a failure of a state typically involves singularizing cardinals. But the problem is that the MERF fact. Of singularizing the mere operation of singularizing cardinals typically entails the existence of weak forms of squares, which, as we mentioned uh, uh, before, are at odds with reflection, are incompatible with reflection. And I think that a very good example witnessing uh, uh, this is this result by Gitik and independently by Yamon and Shalam. Showing that if you have two inner models of set theory, no matter you have, uh, no matter they are generic extension one of the other, whatever, two inner models, where kappa is the inaccessible in the smaller model, but changes its cofinality to omega in the in the uh, larger one, and moreover you don't ruin uh, kappa plus when moving from, <coughs> sorry, when moving from v to 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 w then necessarily you have introduced uh, some weak form of a square sitting on top. So no matter what you have done, you will have introduced this undesired uh, principle. So this is in essence what explains why there is tension between SCH and reflection. If you want to get the CH, typically you want to, you need to uh, singularize, but if you singularize, you get the square, which is, <laughs> Which is in conflict with reflection. So this is in general, this is in general the reason, along with the uh, the ones that I already mentioned, which explains why is it is it both hard and costly to arrange both principles, namely to arrange reflection of stationaries and failure of the singular cardinal hypothesis. I think this is the bottom line uh, of uh, the talk the talk up to uh, this moment. Uh, to conclude my exposition, let me now uh, move to present this notion of the sigma pretty forcing that we introduce in our work and let me give you some ideas about uh, what we understand by an iteration of a sigma pretty forcing. 
But prior to that, let me again uh, retake this uh, slogan that it is hard to manipulate the combinatorics of a uh, singular card. We have already seen some examples, but again, let me stress again this, uh, this uh, the challenges imposed by, by this uh, family of cards. There are essentially two sorts of obstacles that one face up with when dealing with, with this family of cartons, with the family of singular cartons. The first one are of foundational nature and have been already mentioned, namely, uh, or it's re this is related with the fact that almost any manipulation upon the uh, structure, the architecture of these uh, of, of singular cardinals requires very large cardinals in the back. And as an example, or as a paradigmatic example, we have the result of Tugiti Gambudin showing that the failure of SCH at kappa requires a measurable with Mitchell Sorder kappa level plus, or the result due to steel that says that if you want to violate the square at the singular cardinal, then uh, uh, this, this, this entails uh, the existence of a inner model with infinitely many wooden cards. So on one hand, there is this, this challenge, this foundational challenge. But on the other hand, there is another set of obstacles that we didn't mention yet. We have to do with the technical aspect. And more precisely, they have to do with the lack of tools, the lack of techniques, the lack of iteration theorems at the level of singular card. What I understand, what is the template, my template for an iteration theorem is the following, is the one given by, by this block. So an iteration theorem, at least in the stock, would be a result saying that every kappa plus plus length and kappa supported iteration of kappa plus plus CC forcing is again kappa double plus CC. This type of results have been shown extremely useful uh, in set theory, right? The, probably there are uh, people who is more, um, uh, who is really experts in this matter in the audience, or maybe they know another previous example, but to my knowledge, uh, the very first example of such a kind of result was uh, pointed out or uh, discovered by Solvay and Tenenbaum in his famous paper in the Annals of Mathematics. But later, I mean, there have been, I mean, Shela has developed or many, many similar results and have produced a lot of, uh, has found a lot of applications to, to the consistency of many combinatorial principles using this kind of iteration theorem. So it is natural to expect that a similar result at the level of singular cardinals will be useful, or we will, exactly, we will, do, we will useful to establish the consistency of relevant uh, combinatorial principles. And our goal in this project was precisely this, was precisely to develop an iteration scheme, an iteration theorem for singular cardinals, and later apply it to the concrete case of combining reflection of stationary subsets of kappa plus and the failure of the singular cardinal uh, hypothesis, right? This is this was our, uh, the goal of our project. However, our experience in forcing theory tell us that this is kind of too naive a, a formulation of an iteration theorem in the sense that typically to make this result viable or to make the result reasonable, reasonable one uh, needs to require additional properties over the forcings you are iterating. One of these uh, typical uh, additional assumptions that you need to require is the notion of kappa closeness, meaning that every uh, sequence uh, of size less than kappa, any decreasing sequence of conditions of size less than kappa admits a lower bound. This is kind of a minimal requirement that you need uh, in the context of regular cardinal to make all these results, all these iteration results uh, work. The problem is that such a kind of uh, assumptions are not longer available or at least are not prevalent enough in the context of singular cardinals. And a paradigmatic example witnessed in this is the, the standard forcing to shoot a club through a, a stationary set. If you start with a cardinal kappa, which is singular of countable cofinality, and you have a stationary set sitting on kappa plus and con on countable cofinality, 
and you try to shoot a club uh, through it, then the standard forcing to do the job will not be will not be even sigma close because the closure of this forcing depends on the cofinality of kappa, but now the cofinality of kappa is omega. Right? So what I'm trying to communicate is that in the context of singular cardinals, you may encounter our, uh, yourself in the situation when, when even a single iterate of the whole iteration does not satisfy, I mean, it's not reasonable, does not satisfy a reasonable amount of uh, properties uh, for a, uh, for yielding a reasonable uh, iteration, right? So this is the the the, the whole thing, and this is at least uh, to my view uh, one of the reasons that explains why there is a shortage of iteration theorems in the context of uh, singular cardinals. So this raises a question: Is there any hope to succeed at all without these uh, assumptions of kappa closeness? Uh, well, let's see. It seems there is a chance um, for finding the opportunity. You look. You need to look at the uh, at the realm of, uh, of singular cardinal combinatorics, and in particular, to the world of Prikitai forcings. If you look, uh, if you pick your favorite Prikitai forcing, uh, I'm pretty sure that maybe there is some exotic example that I don't know, but but anyway. I'm pretty sure that if you pick any, uh, almost any Prikitai forcing, uh, this forcing will not be sigma close, not even kappa close, right? But still, there is something in the, architect in the architecture of Prikitai forcings that allows to avoid kappa closeness, that, 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 that allows kappa closeness at the time of uh, understanding uh, the combinatorics of the generic extension given by these forcings. Or more precisely, there is something in uh, its architecture that allows to control the combinatorics of the generic extension without appealing to kappa closeness. And this is essentially a, com a combination of two properties. The first one is the so called pretty property, namely decision by pure extensions. And the second one, it's something that can be, this is not a standard by the way, but I think. Uh, to my view, this is a illustrative uh, way to phrase it. It's this notion of a uh, layered closeness. Layered closeness means that the forcing can be split into omega many layers, Pn, according to some reasonable notion of n, which is kind of in the background of the, or in the very nature of the forcing, right? And each of these layers have the property that they are eventually as close as necessary to control the combinatorics below the relevant cardinal property, right? To illustrate this, let me give you the concrete example of pretty forcing. Pretty forcing, of course, has a pretty property, right? Pretty was the first one to discover it, but it's moreover layer close, right? First of all, there is a natural notion of length associated to pretty forcing. This notion of length is simply take a condition and send it to uh, the cardinality of its stem, right? This is the length of a condition. And this defines in general uh, a notion of a reasonable notion of length over the whole poster. This notion of length gives us a uh, uh, division in, into layers, into omega many layers, Pn. And the thing is that each of these layers are actually kappa directed close, regardless. The whole force in P is not even sigma close. Each of these layers separately are kappa directed close, and it can be easily shown that these two things, both prickly property and the fact that each layer is kappa directed close, it's enough to to show that the uh, that no cardinals are collapsed below kappa. Every cardinal is preserved below kappa. Right. So this is the idea. So. Uh, at this point of the discussion, probably it's a good idea to revise our strategy and say that actually we need we need some additional properties, right? So um, um, yeah, so so there is a, maybe there is a hope that uh, the notion of precative force can give us an alternative to avoid uh, to avoid this notion of kappa closeness, which seems to be crucial in the context of regular cardinals. 
right? So what we want to uh, do is finding an iteration theorem uh, for kappa plus length, kappa plus plus length, and kappa support iterations of kappa plus plus CC pretty tight forces. This is the goal. But of course, iteration schemes uh, for pretty uh, tight forcings are already available, have been successfully developed uh, uh, by uh, both Magidor and Gitik. But, it, but the point is that it seems that this iteration seems to be useful or seems to be devised for other purposes. In particular, seems to be devices, seems to be devised for changing the universe below a given regular, below a given large cardinal. Okay, below typically think for instance in the case of of Magius proof. Think in the example of Magius proof for the identity crisis phenomenon, where you start with a strongly compact cardinal, very large cardinal, and you want to make it the first measurable cardinal. So what do you do? You start killing, you, you start iterating pretty tight forcings towards killing all the measurables below your strongly compact cardinal, right? And and at the end you want to preserve that kappa is still strongly compact. So at the end, it will become the first measure of cardinal. But this is the idea. You have a very large cardinal, and you are messing up things using pretty forcings below your relevant cardinal kappa. From the technical point of view, this translates this 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 goal translates into two technical aspects. The first one is that the chain condition of the iterates grows progressively, and this also happens with the degree of layer closeness, right? So, in the very same example that I already gave you. You start with a strongly compact cardinal and you are iterating pretty tight forcings, killing all the measurables. So if you have a measurable cardinal here, call it alpha, a, a measurable cardinal above, call it beta. Of course, the the uh, degree of chain condition of the of the alpha pretty forcing will be alpha alpha plus, but the other will be beta plus. So necessarily they they will need to increase, and the very same thing happens with the degree of layer closeness. Instead, in our case, what we want to do is to keep fixed both things, both parameters. We want to keep fixed both the chain condition and the degree of the layer closeness along the whole iteration. Essentially, uh, the, mm, I think that a good parallel is to, to explain the, 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 the differences between Magdor Sangitic approach and ours is encapsulated in the following in the following uh, the following block. So, on one hand, I think it's instructive instructive to compare Magidor and Gitic iterations with the typical Easton style iteration that will force uh, the GCH at a super compact cardinal kappa. So you need to violate GCH at every inaccessible below kappa, right? To make sure that at the end you can uh, violate it at, at kappa as well. And on the other side of the coin, our iterations are more akin to the potential, the typical forcing iteration that will force um, a forcing action at the level of a singular cardinal. You would like to always force over forcing, sharing, sharing the, the very same chain condition and the like. Right? So the conception is it's different. And for this reason, we needed to develop from scratch a parallel uh, iteration scheme. Okay, so I think we are in a good point to 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 motivate a bit or to introduce this notion of sigma pretty forcing. By the way, I'm not going to I'm not going to give you uh, the uh, official definition. It's a bit uh, quite more uh, uh, large, but anyway, I think this stripped down version is uh, illustrative enough to give you an idea of what's going on there. Of course, if you have uh, if you want more details, I will be happy to to provide it. So uh, we start with sigma, uh, non-decreasing sequence of regular and countable cardinals. So in principle, we allow sigma to be constant, and we set kappa to be the supremum of sigma. And we say that a sigma pretty triple, sigma pretty posed, is a triple PLC, such that P is, of course, a forcing. L is a canonical notion of length, as I mentioned before. There is some some way of some kind of, of of length in the background. I can make more precise this concept if you like. I think 
it's um, clear. So L is a canonical notion of land. C is a map between the forcing and the cardinal mu. Mu is the cardinal which is forced to be uh, the successor of kappa plus, in, uh, sorry, the successor of kappa in the generic extension. So, for instance, in the context of pretty forcing, kappa plus is preserved. So, so mu would be simply kappa plus of the ground model. But if you move to super compact like pretty tight forcings, this mu would be larger. So, mu is the cardinal which is forced to be the successor of kappa plus in the generic extension. And this map C is a map between the forcing and mu witnessing a strong form of mu plus lignus. Mu plus lignus is this property, this classical property saying that you can divide the forcing P into mu many pieces in such a way that each piece of this forcing is linked. Namely, two conditions in the same piece are compact. So what we are requiring here is that our conditions, the two conditions in the very same piece of the forcing are not only compatible, but actually compatible as witnessed by a pure step extension, essentially by an extension where you didn't touch the stem. You just refine the measure one set, essentially. Okay, so this is the this is the 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 the, the notion of chain condition that we that we uh, work with. And that we consider. So, as you see, it's more stronger than a uh, mu plus uh, chain condition. And finally, the third ingredient is, is P. P is a force imposed such that uh, it's layer closed, namely each of the Sorry, layers. Can I ask a question? Your, your, sure. uh, your function C is also incorporating some information on the length because the equality will require the two, the two conditions to have the same length. Sure, exactly. You are completely right. C is also dependent of L. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, and the third and the third element. So, for instance, the typical example that you can have in mind is simply I will give you in a moment. But pretty forcing. If you if you say that uh, C of P is the stem of P then two conditions with the very same stem are actually compatible as witnessed by a condition with the same stem. And, and the third component or the third ingredient is P. P is a force imposed such that is layer closed, right? In the sense that each of the layers are kappa and directed closed and the degree of layer closeness is modulated by sigma, by the sequence sigma. This is where the sequence sigma appears. And moreover, this forcing has enjoys of what we call the complete pricky property. The complete pricky property is a pricky type analogous of the uh, well known completely Ramsey property of uh, infinite subsets of, of omega. And it looks very much as the so called strong pricky property. So the complete pricky property says that if you fix a condition P and a, a length N, some 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 length n and a zero open uh, zero open set d by zero open by the way I mean that it's weaker than open right so open means that if you have a condition p in d and you consider an extension q of p then q necessarily is simple so zero open means that this is true just for q's which are zero step extensions of p pure extensions of p, right so provided you you give me a p you give me an N, and you give me a zero open set uh, D, there is a pure extension Q of P such that either all the possible N X step extensions, all the extensions of, of, of Q of length N fall into D, or none of them uh, are in D. This is the uh, complete paper problem. But the whole thing here is that you can show. So, so typically, sorry, can you explain better what is uh, PN and what is PQN? Uh, ah, sure. On one hand, PN is uh, mm -hmm. the set of conditions in P with length n. Right? Okay, exactly so, n, not at most n. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And what we understand by PQN, right, is the set of conditions in the forcing, which extends Q, but uh, with length N. 
Okay. And zero so, open, can you tell again? I didn't get it. Exactly. Sure, for sure, sure, for sure. Open means uh, that uh, P is in D and Q is stronger than P, then Q necessarily is in D, right? Mm -hmm. Zero open is the same, but a Q is just a, a zero step extension. This is just true for zero step extensions of P. So you have okay. P in D and you have Q zero step extension of, of P, then Q is in D, so it's weaker. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in zero end extension means that uh, the it has the same length. Uh, it's an exactly. extension with the same length. Uh. Exactly. Okay. Again, the typical uh, good example to have in mind is prickly forcing. What is the zero mm -hmm. step extension of a given condition? Don't touch the stem mm -hmm. and refine the the measure one set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So also a clarification on the same lines. So PQN means that uh, the conditions in PQN have length uh, length of Q plus N, right? Exactly, plus, exactly. No, it's plus N, it's not N. Plus N, it's okay. plus N, exactly. Sorry, I should, maybe I should have uh, written. No, no, in this. it's okay. okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so uh, a condition in PQN is a condition R, which is of, which extends Q and which is of length LQ plus N. Thank you for the clarifications. So uh, the whole point of this complete prickly property is that it looks uh, weaker than the strong prickly property, but it has a nice feature, which is that under the umbrella of sigma prickly forcings, complete prickly property implies both the strong prickly property and prickly property. Typically in practice, and what we do with dealing, when dealing with prickly forcing is first proving some prickly property and later do some kind of homogenizations and derive from it prickly property, right? So the advantage of this complete prickly property is that if you show, which is in my opinion quite easy to show, uh, if you verify the previous um, clauses of being sigma prickly, the complete prickly property outright implies both a strong pretty property and pretty property, and there is no need for arguing twice. So this is the, the idea. And this is actually the property that we preserve uh, uh, along the iteration. We don't preserve pretty property, but actually this complete pretty property, which will entail, of course, pretty property. Um, of course, we are preserving this C function somehow, which is the responsible of giving us a good uh, chain condition. Okay, so let me motivate this definition. We have already mentioned all the details uh, here. Uh, uh, the typical example is pretty forcing. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you are familiar with it, uh, especially after uh, Vincenzo's talk. But anyway, let me briefly remind you. So we start with a measurable cardinal kappa, and you, uh, you uh, measure a normal measure sitting on it. And we define pretty forcing as the set of pairs S A, where S is a, a finite a sequence in kappa, and A is a measure one set, a, avoiding this uh, sequence, right? Just containing containing promises above S. Right? This is reasonable, right? Because you want to uh, add uh, omega sequence in kappa. So what you are saying is that I'm just picking things which are above. The previous information and the ordering is uh, the natural one you extend you extend the stem s is an nx step ex is an n extension of p you refine the measure one set a is containing b and the new points from s uh, namely the points uh, from s which uh, do not belong to t are taken from b i think uh, you are already familiar with it so uh, Great. So let's see. Let's try to motivate at least uh, why this is sigma pretty. By the way, I missed. Of course, I missed some other uh, no um, other clauses of this sigma pretty definition. But anyway, um, so let us try to verify that this pretty forcing is sigma pretty. So first of all, we have a natural notion of length associated to this forcing. Simply take the length of the stem, right? Second, uh, you have a map. Uh, you have a map uh, between the forcing and actually kappa. This is a typo, but anyway, I mean, I I brought it kappa plus because kappa plus is the mu 
of my definition. But actually, in this particular case, the 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 map goes to kappa, right? And this map is is uh, just given a condition. It it uh, um, the outcome of it, the outcome of C applied to the condition is the stem. So certainly we have uh, at most kappa many stems. So actually, the the range of this map will be kappa, but anyway, kappa plus. Because this is actually the case uh, for other more involved forcing. So anyway, so of course, if we have uh, if we have two conditions, uh, both conditions have the same value under this map. This means that both have the same stem, right? And under these assumptions, it's quite trivial to ma to manufacturate uh, um, a, a lower bound uh, with uh, which has the same stem, right? A lower bound, uh, the lower bound is S and. And the measure one set is A intersected with two. So very trivial thing. And now comes the now sigma. Comes the sigma, sigma. Now comes the sigma. Sigma would be uh, the constant sequence uh, kappa. Right? Remember, we assume that sigma was non-decreasing. So we allow uh, sigma to be constant. So sigma would be the measurable cardinal we started with. And let's see that sigma does the job. Namely, let's see that the forcing is each of the layers are kappa directed close. This is again very easy, right? Because if you fix a direct, uh, directed set of sizes and kappa for a fixed length, call it N, then this can be identified, this can be identified with a sequence of conditions having the very same stem, right? Because if you have two conditions with the same length and they are compatible, this means that the stem is the same. So you can identify, you can certainly identify this set D as a sequence of conditions having the same stem. And now the lower bound is uh, simply the condition with the stem S and with large set, the intersection of, of all of this A alpha. And here's where we use that the measure is kappa complete and that D has cardinality less than kappa. So intersection alpha, intersection of A alpha is certainly measure one set. So the forcing, the, the, if you fix the layer, maybe the forcing is not sigma close, but if you fix the length, this forcing is very close. And finally, of course, the last component, PU is, has the CPP. The proof is quite similar to the Schumpeter property, so let me not do it because it will take some time. I'm pretty sure that many of you are familiar with the proof of the Schumpeter property. So let me put it this as a black box. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, so pretty forcing is in my pretty, but, uh, of course, I mean, this is a very, this is the vanilla example. This is very, very naive. Actually, the class of Sigma pretty forcing is much more, uh, much uh, broader. Can, can you come back to the previous slide? I, I'm sorry. I forgot. Sure. Sure. So I don't Feel free to interrupt can, me whatever you like. So yeah. the, can you detail more on point three? I'm not following it. Sure. Well. Sure. So, so, so let's see. So we want to show that, uh, maybe should I move again to the previous slide? So remember, look at it in three. We want to show that PN is Kappa indirected close. Kappa N now is Kappa. Okay. Fixed, right. So we want to show that PN is Kappa directed. close. So we want to show that if we fix a length N, let me do it in that way. We, we want to show that if we fix a length n and we, and we consider a directed set of conditions of size less than kappa, we want to show that this set D admits a lower bound. Right? Okay. Okay. But uh, yeah, so, so this, but I don't understand. This sigma is the triple or it's, uh, I don't. No, so let, let, me, slide, you... uh, let me move back. Sigma sigma is on top is uh, a non decreasing ah, okay a non decreasing sequence okay yeah, right That's so fine. we have on one hand the triple and the triple somehow is modulated the properties of the according triple according to the sigma okay exactly right and now the proof uh, it's easy right so you have a directed set of size less than kappa yes now it's fine I understand sorry Perfect. no no no. Please feel free to interrupt uh, as much stuff as you like. 
Okay, so as I say, as I was saying, uh, this example is too naive. Um, nobody will uh, buy your uh, framework if you just manage to uh, encompass pretty uh, forcing. <laughs> Hopefully, this this framework is broader enough to 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 be able to to modelate other more sophisticated uh, forcings at the level of uh, cofinality omega. This is important. We didn't manage yet to make it work for. Uh, uh, cofinality omega one uh, framework seems a bit uh, different, but anyway, other examples, other more sophisticated examples are diagonal pretty forcing, which I think Vincent's already introduced you in uh, previous uh, talks. Here, the sigma would be the kappa ends, the measurable cardinals we started with. You have really half omega me uh, measurables. Another example is super compact prickly, which is this forcing changing cofinality of kappa and collapsing a whole interval of cardinals, right? Bet uh, between kappa and some large lambda. Third, we have Gittig Chagon forcing. This is the forcing used in this paper that Matteo and I were discussing at the beginning, this famous paper by Gittig and Chagon. This is a kind of diagonal version of the super compact prickly uh, forcing. Right? It's a forcing giving you. If you arrange things properly, it's a forcing giving you failure of SCH along with a failure of weak square, the singular cardinal kappa. We also have the aim forcing. This is a forcing developed by, by many authors. It's a kind of extender base, Gitik Chagon. It's kind of uh, uh, it's an interesting forcing. It's a forcing uh, showing that uh, hot. Um, that it is consistent that hot does not compute correctly. Hot of X for every X subset of kappa of a singular cardinal, hot of X does not compute correctly uh, kappa plus. It's an interesting force. The another examples, another interesting examples covered by the framework are uh, some of the typical extender base uh, forcing. The first one is extender base pretty with omega min extender, which is crucial for our application, but it also covers the Case of a single extender and uh, this uh, super compact extender based pretty forcing due to magnetic mobility. So, this is a forcing again, changing of finality of kappa, blowing up the power set of kappa, and uh, um, collapsing an interval of cardinals above kappa. All right, so uh, there is a rich family of forcings falling into this uh, setting of sigma pretty forcings, um, which are potentially iterable. So if you have an application and you have uh, pretty forcing sitting on cof omega, there is a chance that, uh, that this framework will be useful. Okay, so now close to conclude my, my exposition, let me now move to the concrete application that I want to discuss. This is the model where we have failure of SCH at kappa plus finite simultaneous reflection of stationaries at kappa plus. Um, First, let us, let us establish our setup assumptions. So we will begin with a sigma. The sigma will be an increasing sequence of super compact cardinals that we will make labor indestructible, right? We will take kappa being the support, uh, support, sorry, the supremum of sigma. Kappa would be the limit of this kappa ends. Our forcing, the first forcing we will consider that we denote by P will be the extender base pretty forcing with respect to a sequence of extenders sitting on kappa n. They are kappa n, kappa double plus 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 one extender. So remember kappa n are super compact, so in particular strong and whatever. So they certainly admit such a kappa n, kappa double plus 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 one extender. Uh, if you wanted the time for questions, I can display the definition of the forcing, but it's a bit, you know, it's this kind of, uh, the machine was invented by Maggie Rangiti, so you can figure it out that it's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit sophisticated. But anyway, so this is a forcing essentially that given a singular cardinal kappa, right? It blows the power set of kappa without changing cofinalities. You start out right from a, a singular cardinal kappa and you blow the power set of kappa. This time, this time we will blow it to kappa double plus. Right? So let's take it as a black box. And the third uh, setup assumption is that assuming a suitable cardinal arithmetic, we may fix a bookkeeping function. 
and we have functions such that every X in H kappa double plus has a kappa double plus many uh, preimages. So this is essentially the responsible of controlling uh, the objects that will appear along our iteration. This is a, a typical typical object when dealing with this sort of uh, iterations, kind of bookkeeping function. Okay, so which is the first step of the proof? The first step is to ask ourselves which set actually reflect. I mean, which sets alternate reflect uh, reflect by its own? What which sets are not problematic? Which stationary sets uh, do not need any special treatment, right? And what we show is that if Q remember P was the extender base pretty, but now Q is any sigma pretty force, provided sigma of course is this sequence of Super compact cardinals that I mentioned at the beginning, right? So Q is a sigma pretty forcing whatever, whatever sigma pretty forcing, uh, with sigma being the sequence of super compacts, and this forcing moreover does not collapse kappa plus. Under these assumptions, what we show is that then in the generic extension of Q given by Q, you get reflection, finite simultaneous reflection, for every stationary subset of kappa plus sitting. On ground model cofinality different to omega. So, for instance, Q or potentially Q will be our iteration. We will show that our iteration is sigma pretty and does not collapse kappa plus. And in effect, we will have that this iteration give us stationary reflection for stationary subsets not sitting on ground model cofinality uh, omega. Right. So, what's the plan? What's the strategy? The strategy is defining a forcing iteration of length kappa double plus that we denote by P cap, uh, kappa double plus such that it is sigma pretty according to this fixed sigma, right? This sigma from, uh, that we fixed from the very beginning and does not collapse kappa plus. So in particular, by the previous proposition, it will give us that many stationary sets reflect. This is the first thing that we need to achieve. The second thing, is that we need to deal with those stationary sets which are problematic, namely with those with ground model cofinality omega. So what we will need to do is to arrange this iteration to kill all the way up all the potential counterexamples for a, a non-reflecting stationary subset of cof omega. Right. This is the second thing, and the third thing that we want to arrange is that pick up a double plus projects onto the first step. Okay, our iteration will be based on p. P the extender base. P will be the very first step of the iteration, and later we will we will arrange the iteration in such a way that we kill all the potential bad stationary sets. And what we want is that P kappa double plus projects onto the EBPF, the extender base pretty forcing. Why? Because the EBPF, the extender base pretty, will produce the failure of SCH. But since P kappa double plus projects to P, the generic extension by P kappa double plus is larger than the generic extension by by P and thus the uh, generic extension by P kappa double plus will satisfy this failure of SCH, right? So if we manage to to prove this three ballots, but don't, we will don't, get, don't you have also to to, to the stage, sure. double plus by P that by P, P kappa double plus because uh, you could you could have we, collapsed uh, two to the kappa to be I mean. You uh, could have, uh, if P kappa double plus collapses kappa plus plus to kappa plus, then then you have killed your negation of SCH. But in this case, in this case, we will not um, we will not uh, collapse any cardinal, right? Because because we will have on one hand the pretty property, and the degree of layer closeness. This will be the responsible of uh, up uh, to kappa, term, up to kappa. Right, mm -hmm. kappa plus is preserved by a different argument. Uh, kappa plus, um, okay, sorry. You preserve cardinals up to kappa. Our C function will give us a witness for uh, kappa double plus C. Okay. And the problem is kappa plus, but kappa plus is preserved using uh, an argument involving the strong pretty property. Okay. For instance, in the in the in the simpler case of the extender race pretty, uh, I'm following the presentation by Mary Movich. Uh, um, 
Originally, the extender based pretty forcing, uh, the authors, uh, Maggie Durangitic, did not manage to prove pretty property. So you can figure it out how complicated was the forcing. But later, Merimovic did it. And what Merimovic uh, did is the following this forcing is kappa double plus CC, and there is no chance for kappa plus CC. But there is a workaround using the strong pretty property to show that it is actually kappa plus proper. Right? So what we do here is we do an abstract, uh, we prove an abstract result showing you, uh, showing that uh, if you have a signal pretty forcing, then you actually preserve a uh, mu. Mu is now kappa plus, regardless of the sigma pretty force. So you don't collapse cardinal. So actually, you can strengthen your proposition. So if Q is a sigma pretty forcing, it does not collapse kappa plus and it forces this type of reflection. A uh, uh, kappa plus, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. thanks, thanks. I see. Okay. So this sigma brick reinforcing uh, is really magic because not only it gives these reflections property, but it also preserves uh, kappa plus. Yeah, it preserves mu. Mu is the cardinal which is forced. Ah, no, sorry, sorry. I missed something. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. No, 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 no. What we show is that we prove, what, what we managed to show is that you preserve mu. Mu is the cardinal force to be kappa plus. So in our particular case, right, mu is kappa plus from the ground model. So we certainly mm -hmm. preserve ka kappa plus. But let's assume for a moment that instead of conducting this iteration, you start with a super compact uh, pre k type forcing, let's say git hexagon or whatever. Here, the mu is not longer kappa plus of the ground model because you are collapsing cardinals. Mm -hmm. right? So we'll, you will certainly collapse kappa plus. So what the previous theorem is saying is that if you are not working with a super compact like pre k type forcing, mm -hmm. you are not collapsing kappa plus essentially, then you get what you want. I see. Abstractly, you are preserving mu, and mu can be kappa plus or can be lambda for some mm -hmm. regular lambda above. But in our particular case, yeah, this is uh, kappa plus. Does this answer your question? Okay. So, so once yes, we once, okay. So once we manage to to settle uh, to prove these three items, we will be done. Right, the first, the first two items will give us the reflection pattern using the above mentioned proposition. And the third one uh, will give us a failure of SCH. Right. Wonderful. So let me now move to clarify what we understand by iteration of sigma pretty forcing, because our ideology is a bit different uh, compared to the, to the standard one. To the, to the classical one, to the to the one uh, using two-step iterations. Here, the, we don't want to use two-step iterations. So typically, you define the forcing iterations using this, you know, P iterated with some name and the like, and you keep going somehow, right? You get uh, limited stages to do something. You follow some commitment on the support or whatever. Here, we don't want to do that. Here, here we don't want to do two-step iterations. Why? Because essentially what we want to do is to keep the very same chain condition along the way. And this is very problematic, or this seems to be problematic, if you follow the two-step iteration uh, idea. Why? Let's assume for a moment our particular case. Let's stick to our particular case. We want to blow up the power set of kappa, and at the same time, we want to kill all the potential non-reflecting non stationary sets, right? So if you choose the option, if you choose the strategy as us of blowing up the power set of kappa in advance, right, making two to the kappa, kappa double plus, a later uh, um, devising a, uh, an iteration in the two-step iteration style, killing all the, asking whether I have picked a non-reflecting stationary set and killing it and the like, this iteration, even a two-step iteration of it, is not got longer uh, kappa double plus CC, right? Because if you force two to the kappa being kappa double plus, and now you look at the generic extension, and there is a problem, there is some stationary set which does not reflect, 
and you want to and you want to shoot a club through it, the typical forcing for shooting this club will not be kappa double plus CC, right? Because two to the kappa now is large. So there are two options. Either you follow a, a completely different approach, or if you follow the approach of two-step iterations, the classical one, then you somehow need to make sure that, of course, you can you can blow up the power system in advance, and thus you can somehow need to figure it out how do you have blow up at the end the power set of, of a singular carbon. Right. So instead of two step iteration, our slogan is the following. So each time we will be given a arbitrary sigma pretty forcing. Think on it as P alpha, the alpha stage of our iteration, whatever it is. And we will be given a challenge in the corresponding generic extension. This will be typically modulated by a name, right? We will be considering sigma uh, a name, a Q name, right? This will be our uh, input. Our, and our output will be a sigma pre force in A, right? Which projects onto Q, therefore uh, giving us a larger generic extension. And moreover, of course, settling the problem raised by sigma, right? So essentially, this is the idea, right? How do we make this more precise? Is, 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 in, is, we, we make uh, this precise in the following in, in the following way. So we achieve this instead instead of uh, doing uh, two-step iterations. What we do is we somehow invoke a solving problem functor. The functor it's an operation such that given the input, given the sigma pretty force, and given the challenge uh, sigma, given q and sigma, the input of this functor is a Forcing, which solves for some reason the problem raised by sigma, and which moreover is sigma pretty. Right? We need to preserve cardinals, we need to preserve the chain condition. So we need this poset, this outcome poset A to be a sigma pretty. Right? Uh, but of course, this uh, solving problem factor cannot be randomly chosen, right? Because again, we you, you want to preserve very concrete uh, properties. You want to preserve a pretty property you want to preserve chain condition and the like. So what determines which solving problem functors are suitable or not for iterations are the existence of what we call forking projections. The notion of forking projection is a bit more, it's quite more elaborated, but the idea is essentially the following. Forking projections are, uh, is a pair of maps, pi pitchfork. We can go into more details if you like later, but it's essentially a pair of maps, pi pitchfork, Pi is a projection between the uh, large forcing, the A that the functor gives us with Q, right? So as in the two-step iteration, right? You have a projection between the B for forcing onto the small forcing. But moreover, there is another projection that goes all the way around. There is this projection, uh, sorry, there is this map pitch fork, which essentially allows you to move in a canonical way, from conditions from the small poset to conditions to the larger one. If you want to have a very naive example in mind, think for instance in products. Think for instance in the product of P uh, times Q. How do you lift a condition from P to a condition canonically to a condition from P times Q? Simply saying, simply say, sending P to P comma uh, trivial condition. So essentially, this is kind of like this, right? So products are a very concrete example of forking projections. But of course, there are many, many other subtleties here because these forking projections are actually the responsible of uh, preserving the chain condition, are actually the responsible of keeping the complete pretty property. So the notion is uh, more elaborated, but the idea is, is, is this. Pi is a projection and pitch for is a canonical way from moving uh, from conditions from the small forcing to uh, the large forcing, the forcing that settles the problem. This is the idea. Uh, and the upshot or the bottom line is that provided uh, this pair of maps uh, satisfy the requirement, this black box, intentionally black box requirements, then the outcome poset uh, a uh, Q sigma denoted by A 
is not so far from being sigma pretty. So it's almost sigma pretty. Okay, so this is the idea. This is how do we iterate sigma pretty forces. We have a sigma pretty forcing, we have a challenge, and we appeal to some weird machinery, we appeal to some black box that give us in return a forcing that settles the problem, which admits this uh, forking projection business, which at the end will be responsible of uh, letting us to the sigma prettiness of A. Well, but the information you convey in this operation in this slide is very little. I mean, you just take uh, yeah. Q with the product with any other forcing and it would give a map. Yeah, I mean, the official definitions are, are nine cl closest, but let me let me give you more, 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 more ideas. So, first of all, uh, this uh, pi operation is a projection, right? And the pitchfork uh, satisfies the following. If you consider a condition A in the forcing A, right? For each condition A in the forcing A, pitch for A is a map. Pitch for by itself is not a map. Uh, I wasn't uh, be precise. So what is a map is pitch for A for every condition A in the forcing A. And what we demand essentially is that this pitch for A defines an isomorphism between all the set of relevant extensions of our condition A from the large forcing to all the set of relevant conditions of the forcing, uh, sorry, all the set of the relevant conditions of the projection of A to a condition in Q. What do I mean by relevant conditions? What do I mean by relevant conditions? Uh, I'm not sure uh, if you are familiar with this notion of uh, the standard base pretty is very, very, uh, canonical. It's uh, this notion of P concatenated with mi vector. Anyway, the thing is that there is a canonical way, given a condition, let's think in pretty forcing, right? S comma A. There is a canonical way to enlarge this condition with one point, right? Which one point alpha, which is simply take S, add it alpha, take the measure one set, call it A, and simply Chop it. Take a minus alpha plus one. Right. So this is a natural. This is a kind of canonical choice for uh, uh, one extension of the pretty force. The thing is that if you look at all the possible one extensions made up in this way, uh, what you obtain is a antechain below a below the sorry below the condition you started with, which is small. And this is what I understand by this relevant set of conditions. I'm not sure if I have already uh, explained myself, but but this is this is crucial. This is crucial. What you have is fork A is a map between the set of relevant extensions below a, a condition in the large forcing to the set of relevant extensions uh, of the small one. And this is the whole responsible. Of, of the preservation of the pretty property and the like. Uh, are you convinced, uh, Matteo? Do you want? It's a bit hard to explain. No, like no, that. it's okay. I mean, I understand that it's impossible in a seminar to be more precise. I mean, I will be happy to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to discuss it with you by email or whatever. But this is essentially. I mean, essentially, we need pitchfork to to to, to have. Um, to witness a strong, very narrow connection between what is relevant for A, what is relevant for Q, because this is the key to to put to uh, push up the 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 complete pretty property, and we somehow need uh, that um, that this pitch format is related with the C function in some way to make sure that uh, you can actually control uh, your antechains along the way. I'm sorry for. <laughs> uh, sorry, I have to warn you that we don't have much time left. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, so I'm almost done. So this is the. Uh, it's just two more slides. So, um, the iteration scheme uh, is as follows. So you start with a uh, trivial forcing. You start with P1, which is your uh, extender base, the responsible of blowing up the power set of kappa. And at successor stages, you do the the useful thing, right? You want to kill all these uh, bad stationary sets. 
So what you do is you you ask your bookkeeping function psi whether it has found a non-reflecting stationary state. If this is the case, you appeal to this magic functor. This is a functor, by the way, due to a sharp chagon. And, and this magic functor uh, by chagon, this chagon's functor, uh, given p alpha and the challenge produced a sigma pretty force in p alpha plus one, which kills the stationarity of sigma. Right? And this is the way you perceive that the successor stages. At that limit, you simply uh, do inverse limit with kappa support. And what's the upshot of all together? This is again a is sigma pretty and doesn't collapse kappa plus. This is the first thing that we wanted. The second thing is that, by the way, we have defined iteration. We have killed all the potential uh, bad sets. This is done uh, using the typical catch our tail argument, right? We take a name, this name for a non-reflecting uh, for a non-reflecting stationary set. Since the iteration is kappa double plus c and kappa supported, this name can be identified with a p alpha name for alpha less than kappa double plus. And essentially, by the way, you have defined iteration. You have already dealt with this. At some point, you have already dealt with this problem. So this is not longer uh, your reach a contradiction, right? This is not actually stationary. And finally, pick up a double plus for x to p. This is clear because we actually define the notion of iteration in that way, right? We have a pair of maps, and one map witnesses the projection onto the previous stages. So at the end, you will simply need to concatenate to glue all together these projections. And you will end up having a projection onto the very first step, P, which is the responsible of blowing up the power set of Kappa. And that's it. Thank you very much for your passion and for your questions. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, no. Well, I guess I have. Well, well, let's say let's say with one. Uh, let's start with one. So you you start with the limit of supercompact cardinals. How much supercompactness do you need? Like maybe kappa plus plus supercompactness is yeah. enough? Or yeah, yeah, I think so. Kappa double plus supercompactness. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And okay, so I do the second question. Uh, sure. So everything here is with pre-crit type of forcings. How about uh, Magidor type of forcings? So with Oof, this more this than the, openity. Yeah, this is it's, this sounds more complicated. Okay. I, I actually I I need to I need to confess that I didn't uh, uh, think uh, in deep in this particular problem. But for instance, one thing which is clear is that this length function. Uh, in the context of countable cofinality, uh, the length is essentially, is essentially clear, right? You you essentially have a vector. Your condition is a vector, and you essentially your length is the first part of the condition, right? Your conditions typically have two objects or something like that, and you are simply taking uh, the ones, the first ones, right? But in the case of Magidor and Radin and the like, the notion of length is a bit more trickier because what the length, of course, is finite, always is finite, but the length is not so about the cardinality, but rather the position. Where are you located, right? Because mm -hmm. each time you need to project and the like, right? You, you take one of the pairs of Magnetor function, for instance, one random pair, one random pair, and you project this random pair. Now, the, the length is kind of a um, subset of, of omega or something like that. Right. Kind of different. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so are there any other questions? So, okay. So if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And well, I can clear. And we will um, meet again next uh, next Friday with uh, Fosco Dorejan from Tallinn University of Technology. Thank you very okay. much. Bye Thank bye. you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.